Welcome, 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 everybody. Hopefully, I uh, I raised my audio, so if you can hear me a little bit better. The other thing is, I don't know what happened to my intro, but when I tried to play the intro, uh, I've been having technical... Ever since I upgraded my operating system here with the Mac, for some reason, things have been going kind of weird, just like the last, the last time. Uh, also, you might have heard me uh, uh, complaining because I had the mic on <laughs> when I was doing the... Uh, the real quick uh, uh, intro screen in the first five minutes. But uh, uh, today, welcome. We're, we have another uh, Ask Me Anything About Mexico course. Uh, as I let people get in the room, I, it usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes now. Um, I just go over a couple of, uh, just a couple of things, um, just to let you know where, where the channel's at, what we've been up to. Anything that has come up, any questions that have come up. Uh, the first uh, thing that I'm, uh, if you noticed, I did a couple of videos. I did, I'm doing a series on the Mexico IDs. I did a video on what the difference is between the different Mexican IDs, the Corp, the RC, the INE. And I did one on the Corp. One of the interesting things about the Corp is actually Mexico just passed a law, the Senate just approved a law, making the Corp an, an official an ID. Uh, Mexican citizens usually get their corp at birth, so they're going to have to come back in and get biometrics and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's actually going to be a secure form of uh, uh, ID. Uh, and before I start, well, Fredo's in the house, Gringos are us, Rick, uh, Yamilet, my beautiful wife, Cindy, uh, Evelyn Cruz, Lisa, uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, it's great to see you guys all. Uh, Don, uh, how's it going? Um, so, uh, there's a lot of changes that have gone on basically with the Corp. Uh, when you do the residency process, if you're a resident, you probably won't have to worry because they take your biometrics and actually your picture comes out on the Corp now when you're a resident. So it, probably you won't have to do much of anything, but I do know that a lot of times I'll tell you, we need a printed copy of your Corp. So I did that video and on RFC, things are changing too. One of the things that a lot of people I'm noticing on Facebook are saying, how do I get a bank account without having residency? And one of the, I think Intercam, uh, Intercam is one of the banks that's still giving tourists, if you have a tourist visa. But here's the thing, about a year ago, or actually two years ago it passed, but a year ago there was a deadline that every person over 18 years of age with residency or a Mexican citizen had to have an RFC. Now, a lot of people have asked, why do I need an RFC? Because it's a tax number and I don't pay taxes in Mexico. But that's a law that passed. It's for fiscal responsibility. What a lot of people don't understand, even though you don't pay taxes in Mexico, for a lot of large transactions, you need an RFC. Even now, like when I bought my house, my, my first house, I didn't need an RFC. I just need my corp. And actually, I got a, a temporary corp number because I was going through the residency process. And then uh, the RFC, I used to use a, a generic RFC, but that generic RFC is going away. So basically, eventually, to open up a bank account, you're going to need that RFC. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter. I know that banks, there's some banks that are still uh, issuing uh, accounts, but here's the catch. Uh, eventually with your RFC, what the bank will do to get you to come in to give their RFC, and if you don't have your RFC, you're going to have an issue. Uh, if you don't get your RFC, they'll freeze your account and you won't have access to any of your money. Actually, um, believe it or not, two travelers, and act, some banks even quit giving uh, bank accounts to temporary residents. And one of the reasons why they quit giving bank accounts to temporary residents was because at the beginning of all this RFC stuff, SAT was saying that they weren't going to give RFCs to temporary residents. So the banks, to get ahead of things, uh, went ahead and said, nope, no, no more temporary residents. You can't get a bank account. Uh, that's only some banks. Some banks are still doing it with temporary residency. And... Um, and the thing about it is, is that SAT got overwhelmed with this law, so they've been issuing these, uh, what do you call it, uh, extensions and extensions and extensions. So it's very important that you get your RFC because eventually uh, two travelers in Mexico, actually one of them was a temporary resident, 
and their bank decided to pass this new uh, policy that they no longer would allow temporary residents to have a bank account. They got their bank account frozen and they had to go to the bank and then uh, they actually fixed it up because one of them was a permanent resident. He was able to go ahead. Uh, now that bank didn't, uh, I don't know if he had his RC, but, uh, so these are important numbers that you're eventually going to have to get. Uh, even if right now they're saying that you don't need it. Um, and, uh, you want, you want to get that RC. Um, that's one of the goals of my channel is that one of the things that I try to do here, and you know, I, I, like I've said before, I don't get paid for this. I don't ask for any donations. Everything I do, as a matter of fact, to run this channel, I pay out of my own pocket. Everything I do, I do it as a service to the public. I want to give you the information that you need to make decisions because I understand that you can get very, very overwhelmed. When you're trying to move to Mexico, you're trying to do your research, there's just an abundance and an overwhelming amount of information. And a lot of it contradicts. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, when you go to a Facebook group or somebody uh, makes a video or whatever it might be, what happens is, is that nobody really explains the rules. They just explain their experience. So, for example, if I do a video and I say, you know what, I got a bank account. I didn't have, I didn't need anything except for this, this, and this, and this, and this. So you assume, okay, well, Ernie did a video and this is all I need. Well, that's because maybe I opened the bank account with BBVA, but HSBC requires something different. And so what I'm trying to do is I try to get this, hey, look, these are the banking regulations. This is eventually what's going to happen, and this is what you're going to need. Um, what you got to understand, too, is that, you know, a lot of times things here in Mexico, they're very bureaucratic, but at the same time, they can be very simple because a lot of times they're so bureaucratic that a lot of times the government skips the rules. So sometimes you'll go in to connect your water and it's really easy or your connector electricity is really easy. But then other times you might get a process that uh, I always make a joke about Mexico when they decide to enforce the rules, they enforce the rules to the letter of the rule. There's no exceptions. So what my goal is, is to let you know the rules so that you don't get stuck. And I always say this with your pants down. And that way, you know, you know what to do, because when you ask this question on Facebook, how easy was it to connect my water? Oh, it was really easy. I just took this, this and this. Well, then you think that that's all you need. And then all of a sudden you get some government office or one office does it one way in another office and you're in a different city that does it totally different um and i can give you an example from driver's licenses i actually had to take my driver's test the, the, the written test in spanish there was no exceptions i did it here in monterrey um other places you just show up you take a physical you get a facilitator and you get a driver's license you don't need to show anything so what i'm trying to do is trying to weed out the rules because Mexico can be very confusing. Um, I'm not here to scare you into anything. I just want you to be informed. What you do with the information is up to you. Um, as long as you're aware of all these rules, then it's easier for you to navigate. Um, and Mexico can get very, very bureaucratic. I'll give you an example. Uh, my in-laws next door neighbor had a, had a leak. OK, and in the water company there, there's a process that if you have a, a water leak and it's the water company's fault or you have a water leak and you fix it, you can go to the water company and ask for a refund on the excess water that you got charged. And then you have to, you know, basically uh, give some proof and you have to show that you fixed it and the receipt. Well, the next door neighbor, she's an elderly lady. She went over to the water and drainage district here in Monterrey. And they told her, oh, you'd have to do it all online. And, of course, this older lady, she's asked my help because she didn't even have a computer to get on the Internet. And so she came next door to my mother-in-law's house, father-in-law's house. And I sat down and I started to look at the requisites. And you have to upload all these photos. And I couldn't even get into the website. 
Uh, it was so complicated. Uh, I'll even give you another example. My sister-in-law, she runs, she works for an international company. She runs it. She's in an IT department. Uh, she runs a group of engineers. She's an actual supervisor of a group of engineers. And she even comments how frustrated she gets on some of the processes of just doing something simple online uh, because of the security things that are, are built in. And these are things that we don't think of when we move to Mexico. And this is something, that's my goal. And there's like this statistic that always says that like 50% of people leave after five, within five years of coming here because of the frustration or whatever it might be. And like I said, always, I don't want you to be that 50% that leaves. I wanted you to be the 50% that stays. So my goal in bringing you all of this stuff is, you know what? It's your decision to do what you want with it. Because like I said, it might be simple in one sense, or they might not be enforcing the rules, but at least you're aware of the rules so that if they do enforce the rules, you know what to do. You're not caught off guard. Um, also, uh, I just got a couple, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up, and I'm going to be doing a video. Uh, and I've done a video on this. Uh, one of the things that I've been getting a lot of inquiries about is the Dollar App. Um, I've done a couple of videos, and the Dollar App, uh, it's a very risky place to put your money. And so I guess because I've done a couple of videos, I guess it's gained steam again. Um, I they started, I, I, I'm not too familiar because I don't keep up with it, but I guess they started a referral program. So people are going on Facebook and putting their referral links and saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's got better rates than TransferWise. Uh, influencers are starting to promote it again. Uh, they're getting paid to promote this. Um, and then they probably have, uh, I assume, referral links. I, I really don't know because I haven't, I've just been getting questions. Well, what do you think of this dollar app? Because it's, it's making a hit and everybody's talking about how easy it is to use. And the thing is, is that I'm going to, I'm not going to go into the details of why I did a couple of videos and actually maybe they might be a little bit confusing because I went back at and looked at them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a video coming out next week about the dollar app and the risks that you run by using it. Um, but bottom line is, uh, and, and it sounds like a great deal. You can transfer money from the U.S. to the Mexico and vice versa. And it's the lower rates than transfer wise. They give you a credit, a Mexican credit card secure, but it's secured by a balance that you keep with them. But the balance is really cool because you even get interest on that balance sounds like a great deal but what people don't understand is that what's behind it is cryptocurrency um but and this cryptocurrency is a very very volatile market and not only that but the company may even be violating anti-money laundering laws in the united states and i'll explain that um in and the problem is that and also the coin happens to be backed by a company that's under investigation right now by the SEC. So if anything ever happens, like, for example, they get investigated by for money laundering or violating these money laundering laws that I feel that they are, uh, it's up to the government to say, but if they ever become the target of that, or if this SEC investigation ever freezes that company, all your money in the dollar app is gone. And I'm talking from one day to the next. So... I mean, you have to be judicious. It's not about don't use it. It's about being judicious if you're going to use it. And it's not. And the and the thing that scares me the most about the dollar app is is that this credit card, for example, if I want a credit card with five thousand dollars, I'm going to put five thousand dollars of my hard-earned money into this dollar app. And what happens if my five thousand dollars disappears from today tomorrow? Now, from today to tomorrow. That's five thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. I don't. I wouldn't want to lose five thousand dollars just to have a credit card or a thousand or two thousand dollars, even a thousand dollars. So these are the things. Now maybe I'm transferring five hundred dollars. That's really great, um, and it's cheaper. Or it, those are things that you have to decide for yourself. But you also have to understand that the person that's saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Here's my link. 
is making money off of you. The influencer has gotten paid by the company to say this is the slight, the greatest thing since sliced bread. As a matter of fact, one of my my videos is about an influencer getting paid a good amount of money. They have even reached out to me when I was doing uh, negative feedback on them. They even reached out to me and indirectly said, hey, we'll pay you if you kind of quit saying bad things and say that we're the best thing since sliced bread. And I never responded to them. So uh, I will do a video breaking down all the different things, a couple of things I've already mentioned, but why this app is even possibly illegal in the United States. It's just that it hasn't uh, broken in with or hasn't caught the attention of any of the federal law enforcement agencies in the United States yet. But I will explain why, um, and uh, and and we'll we'll go there. And even the question, the, the the CEOs have questionable backgrounds too. They ran away from a company that's currently under an investigation. And I'm these are all things that are fact. I mean, I'm not making them up. I'm not trying to say it's just because it's cryptocurrency. Uh, even the cryptocurrency that's behind this, there's a lot of risk. Uh, but just the fact that they're using crystal currency and this term stable coin, there is no such thing as a stable coin. Cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency. And you. the bottom line is that, that there is nothing, no such thing as stable cryptocurrency. Um, a cryptocurrency can go from one day to the next to a value of zero. That's the bottom line. Uh, but I'll make a video because I didn't want to make this whole thing about that. And like I said, I, I just want to get, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, the housekeeping out of the way and get to the questions. <laughs> so, you know, that's the goal of my channel. I don't, that's why I don't, and, and that's why I don't take sponsorships. That's why I don't uh, take uh, kickbacks from recommending people. That's why I don't, uh, the only thing that I get is ad revenue, and I'm lucky if I even make enough money to, uh, I don't do this for views. Um, trust me, making a video about how to print your corp is probably the least popular and least viewed video, so I don't really get revenue off of that. Um, so it, I, I want to educate you. And even on the 180-day thing, you know, a lot of people can say, you know, on 180 days, everybody's getting 180 days. Well, let me tell you, I've already told you about the 180 days. It's not guaranteed. And it's not that it, you know what? Great, you get 180 days, but you've got to know the rules. Um, what's happening today may not be happening tomorrow. And everybody, all of us, even me, speak from our experience so my experience may not be the same experience as yours. So that's why I always fall back to the rules. Because even though my experience was they didn't apply the rules in my case, they might apply the rules in your case. And the problem in Mexico is when they decide to apply the rules, trust me, they apply the rules to the letter of the rules. And I've been the victim of that already, um, where I had to... To, 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 to go by the rules. So, and it didn't, and it, there was no exception. I'm not kidding you. I mean, to the point of, and actually even my wife, who's Mexican, uh, who grew up, was born, raised here. She left though, um, in her, after college and basically went on to work her career with the Bureau in the United States and then came back and basically, she, even for a person that was a Mexican, now she did, she did, she didn't grow, she grew up here, but she didn't do all those adult things like getting a driver's license or a lot of adult things that you have to do here. And even for my wife, who was a Mexican, Mexican citizen, dual citizen, had problems here. So that's what, and and this is what I'm trying to do here with these lives too. Bring up those questions. So, and if I don't know the rules, I'm go, I'll try to get you the rules. And just remember, just because somebody told you or somebody there, I mean, things just, like I said, they're very, very different here. Uh, they can be one way, one way, the other way, the other way, depending where you're at. So that's the purpose of my live stream. So 
Anybody have any questions or do you want to start off? Now, I do notice we have a, a lot of people talking about Charles Schwab. Um, actually, believe it or not, Brett Jones, uh, Gringos R Us was talking about Charles Schwab. Uh, that they work great here in Mexico, that's another option. You don't necessarily need to get a bank card here in Mexico. But I am going to do another one about opening a bank account. Um, but the actual future rules, eventually, that all the banks are going to have to go under. So I'm going to give you the requirements of a bank account, even though I know I'm going to get a bunch of people that say, well, Intercam doesn't require that, or HSBC doesn't require that, or Bank Omar doesn't. No, these are the rules that are eventually going to come into place. And the problem is if you don't follow those rules, you, ran, you, you risk getting uh, your bank account frozen. But let me tell you something. There are advantages to having a Mexican bank account. We have Mexican bank accounts. Uh, as a matter of fact, I even have a Mexican credit card that we pay off every month. But there's advantages to having that Mexican credit card, um, even though... Uh, you can live totally on a Charles Schwab card, and uh, uh, and uh, you can actually the Wise card. Supposedly, people are saying that it works here. Uh, now, uh, believe it or not, Brett Jones just pointed out something that I was going to say about having a Mexican card. Uh, CFE require a bank card issued by a Mexican bank. Uh, I actually ran into that. We went to see it. We ran to see a fee one day to go pay. And I tried to pay at the, uh, <laughs> I tried to go pay at the little terminals at the CFE because we, uh, on our new house, we didn't realize that it was, you know, was expiring that day. And the next day they cut it off. And I was putting my American debit card in there. And they were like, no, um, you can't, you can't use that. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have a Mexican bank account. There's a lot of things that you have to do uh, with a Mexican bank card. So I have that. Um, oh, and you know what? This is a Mexican. The Oxo Spin card is a, is a good card. It's a prepaid prepaid card. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of options to this dollar app. Don't let anybody try to get you. Uh, and there's a lot of options, like I said. So don't let anybody try to, you know, let me change the, instead of saying don't let anybody rail you into getting the dollar up, l don't let anybody rail you into any particular choice. Uh, for example, ah, you need Emercam or you need Charles Schwab or you need, it's going to be what works best for you, not what works best for somebody else. What, it, what is key here is for you to do your, 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 your research. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. What I happen to be is a guy that knows when he needs to look for information, I know where to look. I have a network of lawyers that I can ask. I have a network of immigration specialists that I can ask. I have a network of local people that I can ask. I even ask my in-laws questions about how things work here in Mexico. Actually, my wife and I had to ask my in-laws a lot of questions of, basic stuff when we got here so you know just remember we all speak from all of our our experiences and a lot, or i'm also a guy that just knows how to read the news a lot of the stuff that i present to you on these videos are are stuff that's really readily available on mexican news if you follow the news so those are th those are resources and because you don't speak spanish don't think you can't read the mexican news because now on Google, you can get on the Mexican news and you can push translate. As a matter of fact, not only that, but Instagram, a lot of these Mexican news channels have an Instagram channel. The Norte here in the north, Millennial, they all have an Instagram channel. And guess what? Facebook or Meta or whoever it was, they have an automatic translate feature. So you can read all of that stuff in English. It's not, or you can go to Google on your, your, your browser and put translate and you'll translate the, the articles. It's a great way of knowing what's coming up and what to do. So uh, Retribution made an interesting, Maddie Gold is leaving Mexico. She's one of the longest lasting expat black, sad to see her go. Yeah, she's sad to see her go. Um, she's, uh, very, got a very nice personality and, and, uh, 
you know, I, I really, uh, really am sad to see that she needs to, she has to go back home and uh, whatever hardships, I hope she's uh, doing, uh, that this works out good for her. Um, and it's, it's really sad that she's going, but, you know, I think, uh, I haven't really looked at her live streams, but the little that I've seen is, you know, she needs to take care of herself. And I, and, and I think she's making that a priority and, 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 and doing that and, and, and finding the direction she wants in life. And you know what? I have all the respect for that. Um, I really do. Including a lot of, uh, they like Mexican credit cards. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the motels, hotels, there's a lot of things that you need to do. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, he said he tried to get one, uh, a spin card. He said, because I don't have a Nina. And Brett Jones says, I signed up online using my then temporary card. I think, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure, Brett, when you signed up online, did you sign up through the app? I actually have an app, the spin app, the, the OXO app, and where you get points. And I think there you can actually sign up for the spin card from the app if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so let me go back to some of the things, but anybody else have any other uh, questions? I know that everybody's talking about the Charles Schwab. That's one of the, um, the one of the great things about Charles Schwab. That's a, one of the best kept secrets too in the expat community. Well, not even best kept secrets because everybody uh, uses them. Okay, Brett said... Uh, I used their website to sign up, then later downloaded the app. Yeah, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't applied for a spin card, but I know that it works because I'll tell you what happened. Um, one of our workers here, local workers that works in construction here, we actually had him do some extra stuff on our house, and we had to pay him. Uh, we had to do a bank transfer. That's another great thing about having a uh, Mexican bank account. We, we have BBVA. And, uh, and we can go through the app and someone can give you their debit card number and just say, here's my debit card number and you can transfer money. It's kind of like Cash App or Zelle or Venmo. That's the way it works here, but it's bank to bank. And this guy gave us a spin card and a debit card number and we transferred the money and it worked just fine uh, from our bank. Uh, so we know that it does work. Um, Heather K, I went through the entire process at Ben Norte. It was a long day and lots of getting my ducks in a row to open an account. It's been very worth opening our Mexican bank account. Yes, Heather, it, it is worth having one, uh, and it's important. But one of the things that I want to warn everybody is just make sure you get that RFC. And here's the thing. I'll give you an interesting thing about the RFC, believe it or not. They never froze my account. Now, my wife, we have two separate accounts. Uh because we opened up one in my wife's name and because at that time we just, and we opened another one in my name uh, because it's, and we would have had to close the other one to open one in both of our names. So we just did it that way. And that way we would both have debit cards. But at the time that I opened my account, I didn't have an RFC. And all they actually asked me for was my passport. And they even said, we have this special account for uh, foreigners. And they asked me for my passport. I gave them my residency card. Uh, I also needed a Mexican phone, which I had. And they set up the app. Everything was going fine. And I went back to do some banking with, uh, and I had already got my RFC, believe it or not. So I went back. I'm not sure if I went to go pick up a credit because they had given me a credit card, um, and which we use and but we pay it off at the end of the month because the credit the interest rates are not 20 percent a year it's 20 percent a month so it's really outrageous but there are some advantages to having a credit card plus i we wanted to build some credit because uh for example solar panels things like that they finance so you wanted a credit we wanted a credit history so i went to go pick up my card and they were like we can't give you your card and I'm like, okay, what's going on? It's because you don't have your RFC on file. And as a matter of fact, we can't do any other things like give you a card or anything else because you don't have your RFC on file. 
and uh, and so I had to provide my RSC before they would give me the credit card. And Heather, I, I understand. You said I, I did have an RSC to open at Ban Norte. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of them that are requiring it now. Uh, what a lot of banks are doing, though, is that, yes, you also need a, that's the other thing, Heather, good point. I also needed a Mexican phone number, too. Uh, uh, and so I couldn't do any other banking. Well, I, you know, I still had access to my money. They didn't freeze my account, thank God. But I couldn't get my pick up my without until you put your RFC. And a lot of banks are catching up on that because it's, before it used to be just a corp and uh, and uh, your your residency card. And some are not allowing temporary residents. I hope that changes. Uh, I believe um, I, I want to say it was Ban Norte. I don't know which one it was for two travelers, uh, but uh, they are they. Some have said no temporary residence, but that is probably because of the RSC thing. But once they get that straightened out, because it's kind of weird, the temporary, when SAT was mandated to give everybody an RSC, they were turning away temporary residents. But at the same time, the temporary residents were saying, okay, well, I need to go get, a, I need to go work. Uh, some were saying I need to work. So I need the RFC to work. And then you were going back to immigration and immigration was saying, you need an RFC before we give you a work permit. So there's been a lot of confusion with this with this new RFC law. Uh, the good news is that they haven't really ironed it out, so nobody's really following the rules yet, but eventually that's what's gonna be able, that's what's gonna happen. And we also, when we purchased our property um, this year, uh, I was required to have an RFC. Um, I could not use a generic RFC uh, like I did when we purchased our property the first time. And Lisa has a question. I have a question. My husband and I are looking into moving to Mazatlan instead of Puerto Vallarta. My concern is I hear a lot about the state of Sinaloa is heavy with cartel. What is your opinion? Actually, Lisa, Mazatlan's a very nice place. It's very safe. Um, and I always going to give my, my, and actually Brett is actually from Mazatlan, Brett Jones. He can tell you. Um, it's the same as any other city. I've been to Mazatlan. Uh, Mazatlan has gotten a bad rap. Actually, Bill, the, Bill Dallas Lewis is from Mazatlan, and I did an interview with him not too long ago, and I lost the recording, and I haven't been able to get back together with him to do the interview. But one of the things I told Bill, you know, to get rid of the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the, the misconceptions about Mazatlan, is I told, I told Bill, you know, everybody talks about, Matsalan being in Sinaloa, you know, what, what's the deal on that? And, he, you know, Bill, he's a straight shooter, and he said, you know what, it's great here, you know, uh, and it's a stigma. It's, it's, it's a stereotype of Sinaloa in general. Now, I wouldn't go to certain parts of Sinaloa, I'll tell you that. And here's, a, a, and Brett, uh, he lives in Matsalan. Here, here's his, Here's his best answer. Things are the same as any other city. There's crime, yes, but nothing out of the ordinary. And actually, believe it or not, uh, Brett, if I'm not mistaken, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that even when there's been, um, uh, how would you say, uh, I, when they caught Chapo Sun and there was a lot of violence in Sinaloa because they were fighting back with the government. There's been a couple of instances in Sinaloa where there's been cartel fighting back against the government or it's gotten really violent. None of that actually spilled into Mazatlan, um, believe it or not. None of it actually, correct me if I'm wrong, Brett, but none of that violence actually spilled over into Mazatlan, even though they were in the parts of, in parts of Sinaloa. So... Uh, I believe Bill Dallas Lewis is moving to Morelia. Actually, Cindy K. Bill's lived in a lot of places. He lived in Puerto Vallarta before he went to Matalan. I wouldn't be. I I haven't kept up with him, but uh, I wouldn't doubt it if he's moving to Morelia. He's one of those types of people that loves to, to uh, loves adventure. Uh, Fred Joan, he's leaving Matalan to find some place less expensive and not so hot. Yeah, that that's. Uh, I haven't kept up with him. I, I've dropped in in a couple of his live streams, and we haven't had a chance to 
uh, hook up again to do that interview. It has to be a Mexican cell phone. Wouldn't use my landline open account. Yes, it has to be. And I'll tell you why, Susan, is that they use your cell, the app. <laughs> Remember how I said about sometimes it's hard to do things on the internet and the security on the internet is so like uh, even impossible sometimes to get in. Uh, actually, uh, I think Denise, um, I don't know if she's on tonight's live stream, but asked me if I could do a thing on ear firma which is the RFC where you can go in and you get a, uh, an encrypted key to get into your RFC and you can make changes. The truth is, um, and, I, and I never got a chance to really, and I apologize, Denise, if I didn't uh, respond to you, but the truth is that I had to get my accountant. We have a, a family member that's an accountant. I had to get an accountant to get into my e-firma to make changes to my RFC. That's how complicated it can get now with the phone getting back to the phone the reason why is because your you the app is tied to your phone your phone app is tied to your bank account and also there's a token that needs to be given for example when you log in and you need to log in through the when you log into your some banks when you log in they'll say give us your token then you have to get onto the app on the cell phone to get the token number to verify yourself to do the online banking. Now, uh, so that's why you have to have a Mexican cell phone. And then also, when you're in the process, like for example, we just changed our, our San Miguel numbers to Monterrey numbers, and we went into BBVA and changed the number, and my wife, they had to reprogram my wife's cell phone. And part of the, the thing is they actually, it calls your cell phone, and you have to you know, pick up the cell phone and say, yes, it's me, and that type of thing. They set up the app. Uh, some banks will still do it without a with with a landline, but most of them now it's all tied to your cell phone because of the app. Good, we have a Mexican cell phone. No, all we ever get is spam calls, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, Telcel is notorious for that. Uh, uh, trust me, we have a Telcel number, and we get nothing but we never answer. Actually, we never answer calls. We just let them. And most businesses done on WhatsApp, so we just say to WhatsApp us or leave us a message. But even then, I think Telso charges to pick up your messages. And nobody really ever leaves a message. But, yeah, you're very and also spam text. Uh, we usually get a lot of text messages. I think Telso probably sells the uh, the list, customer lists to, to businesses. But, uh, but it is good now to have a... Uh, uh, a Mexican phone. I have, I was carrying around two phones. Uh, I think I did a, 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 a live stream. Now I only carry one. Uh, most phones are capable of doing this now. The iPhone is totally eSIM uh, now in the United States, but the one I think they sell in Mexico, one a, a SIM, uh, you can still get them with SIMs, but I have an iPhone 13, which you can, Pro, I have a regular physical chip from my U.S. number, and I have an eSIM for Telcel. The only thing with Telcel is they require that you have a postpaid plan. AT&T will let you do an eSIM by, with a prepaid plan. But I have both my numbers on one phone. Uh, I have a, um, a, I, I switched over from a Galaxy, Galaxy Note Ultra, a Galaxy Note 20 Ultra, and that had the eSIM capability. I think most phones now have eSIM, and so you can program that number into your, uh, and if not, if you want to carry a U.S. phone number, uh, most of the U.S. phone companies now have eSIMs, and then you can just put the physical SIM if you want to prepay. And actually, uh, Nerd Ono said, he also seems to have changed things. You can only get the card using their app or going to the store. Um, you're talking about cell phone service, Nerd, I guess? Oh, wow, Brett, Brett, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That they have a ferry terminal that goes to Baja Sur. Wow. So you can actually go to Baja Sur from, from, uh, from Mazatlan. I knew it was across the, the bay, but I didn't realize that there was a ferry. Uh, I used a Mexican SIM card on my, my phone and gave the bank that number. I can still use the BBV app on my U.S. phone, though. Yes, that's true. You can still use it on your U.S. phone. 
but when you set it up there's a it calls you back so you need the you the the mexican sim card but the but yes it does work as a matter of fact like i said i have two sim cards in my phone and I have it on the U.S. phone number most of the time. The reason why I have Cricket service, which is AT&T, which roams on AT&T towers here, I get unlimited data, which here you get, they limit your data. So uh, I only switch over to Telcel if i am got a bad signal, to be honest with you. And it works just fine uh, going through the American phone number or being connected to the U.S. phone uh, works just fine. Don Lu, my realtor has been extra helpful during my purchase in Mexico. Is it appropriate to provide a gift tip to her knowing she will share the commission of the sale? Actually, Don, I haven't really dealt, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, for example, I'm dealing with a realtor right now selling my house. Um, I don't, I, I haven't really heard of that, you know, giving uh i've given a gift to my realtor in the united states <laughs> a gift basket um is it inappropriate no i mean i don't think it's inappropriate i think if someone did something for you and you give them a gift i mean that's not uh, it's not against any kind of rules or laws here one of the things that you have to understand about mexico as far as real real estate um and actually uh you monetary gifts probably in the united states are against the rules um but that's because they have real estate licenses here in mexico you need to understand that anybody can sell you real estate anybody can be a real estate broker uh there's no requirement for real estate like that's one of the things that you need to be very careful of when you're buying property here um anybody can sell you real estate here the thing is that there is a group here called ampi which is an attempt by realtors. Basically, it's a group of realtors that got together and said, we need to have some type of like legitimate way of legitimizing realtors here in Mexico. So it's an association and you join if you're a realtor. And basically, uh, AMPI, uh, you get their certification or their endorsement. And basically, that's the way you can tell that a realtor is actually certified and knows what they're doing or whatever. And if they miss, they also have an MLS system and everything else like they do in the United States. So, um, um, so like I said, you know, it's, I don't see, you know, I haven't heard of it, of tipping uh, monetarily to a realtor here in Mexico, to be honest with you. Um, is it against the rules? Not that I know of because there's not very many real estate rules here. Pretty much anybody can sell you. I actually, they can sell you beachfront property in Arizona here. That's the big problem with real estate here. You've got to be very, very careful. Um, there's several property, especially, especially in, in Merida, in Cancun, uh, even here in Monterrey, uh, there's a couple of uh, large developments that were doing pre-sales, uh, sold and the building was never built. Uh, there's in San Miguel, there's a whole, uh, actually they end up uh, arresting them and putting them in jail. There's a whole group from Monterrey that went over there and took a bunch of deposits on properties on a supposedly development and they didn't have any real estate licenses or anything and they ended up not making the development and running away with the money. So there's not any rules that I know of. Um, and Rick was saying, I'm a realtor hero, Maui. And then while it's more common to for me to, okay, they gift me as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we gifted our, our life. when I sold my house in Texas, we gave a gift basket to uh, my realtor and said, thank you for all the hard work you've done. Uh, as far as monetarily, I, there's no rules I, that I know of. Uh, it's up to you. And one thing that I, t I talk about and I see in Mexico a lot too uh, is that uh, a lot of times in Mexico, you'll see a lot of people saying, don't tip, don't tip because you're ruining it because they're going to make more money and then it's going to ruin it for the locals. And you know what? Uh, you got to understand, 
a waiter is just like a waiter in the United States. They make a minimum amount of money, and what they make is what you tip them. Uh, you know, and if you give them, a, you know, a hundred dollars, or you give them five percent, you know, that's up to you. That's not up to someone else to tell you don't tip, or only tip ten percent because you're going to mess up the economy. That's one thing that I see a lot in Facebook groups. You're going to mess up the economy by giving so much money, and then you think you're important, and then you think you're so important because you give fifteen or twenty percent. You should only be giving five percent or ten percent. You know what? Tipping is tipping. It, it, I mean, uh, if the person gave you good service and you feel like give them 500 bucks, give them 500 bucks. That's your, that's your business, not mine or anybody else's. Um, there's a, now there is kind of, you know, uh, social rules. Uh, yeah, I think it, believe it's 10% here is the, what do you call it? The customary rule, but it doesn't mean that you have to, and it doesn't mean that you have to follow that particular rule. And how does it work when bringing an AT&T phone abroad in Mexico? Do I pay an international? No, actually, uh, you can call over there. Let me tell you, I have I invested in the sexy Mexican phone for communications while there. Streetcar named Desire, literally AT&T is free roaming, especially if you got one of their plans that's unlimited or whatever. It's free roaming and uh, free roaming and data. In Mexico, you can make calls back to the United States. Now, I have a Cricket phone, which is AT&T, and I'm almost positive AT&T has the same thing. They have Wi-Fi calling. Uh, I use the Wi-Fi calling from my house, so whenever I need to call a U.S. number, 1-800 number, I use the Wi-Fi calling. It works just like if I'm in the United States. And there's no limits. The one that limits you is T-Mobile. T-Mobile is free roaming and all that stuff in Mexico, but if you use it, for more than 50% for a period of three months, they cut you off. Um, but we've had no problems at all whatsoever. The thing about AT&T, and I've explained this before in my past live streams, is that AT&T Mexico is the same company as AT&T United States. They're just two different di divisions. It's a big one, big conglomerate. So they don't have to pay each other uh, roaming fees. For example, Telcel roams on Telcel roams on T-Mobile. T-Mobile roams on Telcel. They have an agreement. And I'm I'm almost sure it, they don't pay each other, but that agreement is, hey, you can use our towers, we can use your towers, but you can't abuse our towers, and the other one, you can't abuse our towers neither. So that's why you got the free roaming, but then they also cut you off if you're abusing it because you're actually on someone else's company's towers. So. Oh. <laughs> You're watching the NFL. Get sorry for the tie. I have multiple texts going on in the NFL game. Rick Brandt. Yes, your your Mexico agent was surprised when I sent her a gift. That's not uncommon. Most Mexicans won't ask you. They don't expect a tip kind of per se. Um, it's not one of those things that's ex expected. Uh, you'll find. Here's the other thing too. Grocery. When they pack your grocer, groceries, those people don't get paid anything, literally, by the actual HEB or City Market or uh, Soriana. They don't get paid anything. They only get paid what, what you tip them. And most of the time, I mean, I've even walked away, like, embarrassed because I don't have any change in my pocket. And they happily bag your stuff. Uh, now, I honestly can say I wish you know uh, sometimes i go back to my car and i come back and give them a tip uh, because you know that's for me i don't feel that's right but uh it's not tipping here is not something that's kind of expected in a sense maybe in the tourist areas yes but uh it's not one of these things where they're just waiting for you to just give them an extra uh, where, where, whereas in other countries sometimes. Now, I have noticed in tourist areas are kind of waiting for you to say, they look at the money you give them and say, oh, thank you. Uh, but that's usually in the like Cancun, Cozumel, those areas. Yeah, I get that get the streetcar. It's the international plan. Actually, it's usually the uh, AT&T... Uh, just make sure that it's free roaming in Mexico. Most of their plans that are unlimited uh, text and talk and all that stuff is that already includes the international plan. And it's not extra. It's usually that $80 you pay for your plan.
Gringos are us. We use AT&T and Gina has a SIM card for a Mexican number. We get toll free calling to the family in the US, but we are also still paying the US prices. Yes, you do, you have to pay. That's why I use Cricket versus AT&T. Uh, now I will say that Cricket, um, I can say that Cricket, um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, stinks when I'm in the United States because I well, usually when I'm in the United States, it's usually in, uh, oh shoot, hold on. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm having a little bit of a problem with my streaming software, but uh, usually uh, when we go to South Texas, everybody has cricket, so every and you're deprioritized. So, like, man, I'm like, wow, it's really super slow. But I'm only in McAllen, Texas, for a day or two, or for the day. Uh, so it, now, when I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, our cricket phone works just fine. I mean, I get. Even though it says connected to 5G, now in McAllen it says connected to 5G and I only get like one megabit. I mean, I'm lucky if I can even get on Facebook or whatever. I, I can send text messages, but believe it or not, what I do is I switch over to the Telcel data because it's free roaming in, in the United States and I'm only not going to use up all my data just in a day. So... Yes, actually, Evelyn, is there a Mexican cell phone company that will allow your Mexican cell phone to be used in, while in the USA and in Mexico? Yes. Actually, AT&T will let you do it. AT&T is free roaming and international calls in the U.S. Uh, they don't have Wi-Fi calling here like they do in the U.S. where you can jump onto the Wi-Fi, but they do have international. Uh, also, Telcel does have... Uh, just, if you get in a normal Telcel, now so you got to be careful with the Telcel prepay prepaid plan. You got to make sure that's included. Uh, but usually, as long as you you make sure you have one of those plans, it will roam. Telcel roams on T-Mobile in the United States, and AT and T, of course, uh, roams on AT and T towers in the U.S. And uh, I just mentioned right now when I'm in McAllen, I switch over sometimes because my Cricket phone is unbearable with data. Um, and so I get better data because it switches over to the, to the Telcel towers. But, yes, you can get a Mexican phone that you can use in the United States. And it works just like regular Romy. Uh, when you get there, you even get a text message saying, by the way, you're here. Uh, but you just got, with Telcel, you have to be careful with the prepaid plans because there's some people that get the minimum where they just buy the minimum amount of data, and sometimes international is not uh, included. And... Uh, Evelyn Brett, yep, Telcel works. As long as you have one of the plans that has the free, and actually it'll say free talking, or free roaming in the United States and or international calls to the United States. And gringos are us, yep. We tip totally based on the quality of service, our money, our choice, exactly. That's the way I see it, and that's the way I've always been. A... What about the parking lot guys? Do we tip them? Uh, they get mad when you don't, LOL. Actually, believe it or not, you, there's these guys in the parking lot. For people that don't know what you're talking about, there's people in the parking lot that will usually help you and guide you out, and they'll, they'll wave a little thing, hey, come, come, and they'll stop the other cars, that type of thing. Uh, those people don't get paid. They're usually people off the street that decide to get permission some of them, I don't even know if they have permission to be in the parking lots to, to help you out. Some of them actually um, are not contracted, but they make agreements with whatever business it is, but they don't get paid by the business. And yeah, uh, if I have extra, t you know what I do? I actually, in our console, and we have a cup holder, and every time we get, because, you know, cash is king here, and a lot of times you get a five pesos 10 pesos they give you five pesos in coins and we just put all our coins in the cup holder and you know what if we have extra coins in the cup holder give the parking lot guy a, you know he helped us come out uh it's the same thing with when they fill up with your gas well we our rule of thumb is uh just like gringos are us what kind of service they give us is what to uh what 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 we give them for example if a gas attendant is busy and they just fill up the gas then, okay, that was your job or whatever. But if they air, wash our windows, check our tires, of course, we tip them. So, yeah, Brett, 
actually the same thing happened to me t-mobile when i first moved here i had them and they definitely sent a warning that they were going to shut me off and i didn't come back to the usa if i didn't and actually believe it or not that's what happened to me brett and actually before i moved to mexico it happened to me i was here for a couple of months uh, after i retired before we moved uh it was when i was going through my health issues and um i got a message we had only been here for three and i was like dude i'm going back to the us i just i'm stuck here for three months and they were like nope next week we're cutting you off because you use more than 50 percent and my, their only solution was well use the wi-fi calling or use wi-fi don't use the roaming or don't you don't turn on the mobile the mobile phone when you're when you leave the house and i'm like well what's the use of having a mobile phone literally um we actually went back to McAllen, Texas, because we were only two and a half hours away for the day to switch out T-Mobile, to cancel the T-Mobile service. And I got, I basically literally picked up cricket uh, cards. And Lane Dara, speaking of tipping at a grocery store, what is the amount based on say a hundred dollars of average groceries should i tip or uh i give 100 pesos is that okay um maybe 100 pesos is is a lot but if you feel uh like i always said did, tipping is a personal choice blaine uh we give anywhere from uh depending on how much groceries it is if it's a humongous card and i mean literally they're filling up carts and it's a lot of stuff and you know, we'll, we'll, I mean, I'll break out a 50 peso bill or a 30 peso bill. Uh, normally, if it's just something, uh, when you say $100 of groceries, because depending on where you're at, Blaine, $100 <laughs> of groceries can mean a whole cart. Uh, and in other areas, if you go to another, or, or depending on what supermarket, if you go to city market, $100 could mean five items, uh, believe it or not. Um, and especially here in Monterrey. So it all depends on how much work. I mean, it's what you feel you need to, to give, uh, what you want to give. Um, you know, if you feel that this person deserves 100 pesos, you're, you're definitely helping them out. They're normally underprivileged people that need the money. I mean, I'm not, and they don't get paid anything. Zero, zilcho. They don't get paid anything by the grocery store other than the privilege of being able to bag your groceries. So just for, take that into consideration when you want to tip. I just watched your space regular immigration process video. I was in Mexico in 2010 and 21. Would I qualify for the program? Susan, yes, you would probably qualify for the program. The only thing you're going to need is an expired visa. Uh, and... The only thing that's happening with the regularization program right now with the expired visas is some uh, some offices are requiring that the visa be a 180 day visa and that you came in last year. Like, in other words, it was well, actually, those are not going to be that common anymore. But like towards the beginning of the year that maybe like in March that you got your 180 days. And the other uh, thing is, is that. Uh, if you're going to come in now to get seven days, it's kind of, believe it or not, it's really funny and ironic because they were not giving 180 days automatically. And now they are to, uh, how would you say, uh, rush people through the airport. So uh, even if you ask for seven days, you're going to be like, I don't care. Here's 180 days. So if you're just coming in right now, if you have an expired pass, if you do have an expired FMM, it just depends on where you actually uh, apply. Some are just requiring expired FMM. It doesn't matter. Uh, other offices like San Miguel started saying that if you have multiple entries, uh, what I think they were saying more than multiple entries is if you were doing the 180-day every 180-day border run, then they're not taking applications. It just depends what office. What I would do, Susan, is get a hold. And even if you're going to do the process yourself, get a hold of a facilitator. They'll be able to tell you, yeah, you qualify, and yeah, um, what's your, your, your situation? This is how much I'll charge. And then if you want to use them, use them. If you don't, then you go to the immigration office. I'm not – maybe it's 
a bad piece of advice because the facilitator went out of their way to talk to you about this. But most of them are very, very nice, and they'll help you out as much as they can, and uh, even if you don't contract them. And uh, it all depends where you're, where you're right now at this point. It depends where you're, uh, where you're applying. Some are just saying we want 180 days. So if you came in like in January, that's cool. As long as the 180 day expired visa, which is plausible because now it's October. So you might have an expired visa that you got in January or February. So it all depends. Some are requiring that it was an entry in 2022. But as far as the entry in 2010 and the entry in 2021, you qualify. It's just a matter of getting the expired FMM straightened out. And what office you're going to. <laughs> the, I think Huatuco is a little bit more, and Merida also, I believe, is a little bit more lenient on the regularization program rules. Uh, I think all they require is an expired visa. I mean, uh, an FMM. And, and, of course, the entry requirements. Uh, Verizon, Heather K. Yeah, Verizon uh, allows international, and Telcel does have plans that include all the SAN services that my Verizon plan has, but it's 10. Um, I Verizon, the thing with Verizon, I had Verizon many years ago. We used to come back and forth to Mexico a lot, but this is back in 2017. Cell phones have changed so much. But I used to have to pay like an extra amount for Mexico. And I used to only come to visit with my family, to visit family here. And I don't know exactly the roaming rules right now. To be honest with you, uh, Verizon has kind of, went. they used to be the best carrier in the United States. And now with all these other competitions, um, really, I don't know. But in the old days, you used to have to, to pay some extra and I don't, I don't know, if, uh, but I will tell you that Verizon's probably in the same boat as T-Mobile. There's probably some limitation because Verizon has to roam on uh, either AT&T or Telcel here. I don't even know who they roam on here, but there's got to be some, even if there's some free, it's not totally free. And I do know that Spectrum, uh, not Spectrum, Infinity, I have Infinity Internet in New Mexico, and they were trying to sell me their cell phone service, and it's through Verizon. The Verizon's the carrier. And they were telling me that it doesn't work in Mexico. And I was like, okay, well, then I can't, I can't sign up with you. But there is, I do know that when I had Verizon, there was some international stuff. And Telcel, it's pretty much, um, if you get the right plan, um, I, I think it's pretty much all international calls uh, and roaming are free. Uh, but of course, here's the thing with Telcel. They don't have unlimited plans. I will tell you this again, Telcel doesn't have unlimited plans. So, uh, for example, if I have five gigs of data, I per I buy five gig, the five gig plan. If I have five gigs of data and I, let's say I've used three and I go to McAllen, I only have two gigs of data left. It's not unlimited like it is in the United States. I think Movie Star is the only one that offers unlimited. Even then, Movie Star actually throttles you after a certain amount of gigabytes that you use or whatever. But uh, and I know some people have said, "Yeah, there's unlimited." Telcel has un it's unlimited talk and text and WhatsApp and Facebook and I, some social media stuff. But it's not unlimited data. Uh, just remember that you're paying. So if you if you go to the United States and you have five gig of data. You have five gig of data over there or whatever you have left for your plan for that month. And if you have to buy more data, then you have to buy more data. So. Select. A, uh, yeah, well, actually, this is what I was going to say. Select $100 in uh, uh, groceries of groceries is three bags. Uh, LOL. Actually, here in Monterrey, depending on what store you go to, you can end up spending $100 in groceries in like less than three bags. Um, and uh, and also in San Miguel, the same thing. But 
That's another thing that I'm going to tell you. We're going to be doing some videos in San Miguel. Uh, that's another thing I forgot from my first part of the, the stream is that I've been promising a house, a vid, house video of my house here in Monterrey, which I'm still putting together and trying to gather all the footage. But I never did one on my house in San Miguel. And I do know that everybody does these videos and, about living in uh, affordably. And uh, our house, I'm not pushing it, pushing it, uh, trying to sell it. Yeah, we're trying to sell it. But what I'm going to do in San Miguel is I'm going to take you through my house and show you what you can get for the value because San Miguel is also one of the areas that people say is very expensive and it's, but I'm going to show that even in San Miguel, uh, I'm basically I'm going to show you my house in San Miguel, the kind of house you get for the money compared to the kind of house you'd get in the United States for the price that I have my house for, uh, is very affordable compared to different places. Uh, even though this is the quote, quote, expensive area of Mexico or that uh, San Miguel is. Then also, I'm going to go to the to buy food. And I'm going to show you, yeah, if you live in San Miguel, you can pay for $100 for three bags of groceries at certain grocery stores. But you can also take $100, well, it's not even $100, 100 pesos and come back with a lot of bags of vegetables and stuff. Uh, maybe not 100 pesos, probably a little bit more. But for 10 bucks, uh, you can pretty much eat for a week and a half. So it all depends on where you go. But I'm going to show you how you can live affordably, and even in San Miguel de Allende. And that's one of my projects that I'm working on, uh, that we're going to work on when we go there. And even, uh, actually, I'm not even going to just show you my house. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to try to get out. I'm also even going to have a realtor on that uh, my realtor, uh, since he's selling my house, I might as well take advantage of him and, and interview him and tell uh, so he can give you tips on what to look for. And also, I have one or two places that I may be able to show that are even more affordable than my house, and I can show you what you can get. And that it's not about uh, necessarily that you can actually get something affordable, even in San Miguel de Allende. And actually, in the same uh, complex, not the same neighborhood, but the same places where I live. So, uh, and half the price of my house, but it's half the house, of course. But you can get something affordable there too. And thanks, thanks to do some intro on another video. Great job, as usual. Thanks, uh, Gringos are us for Pat. Uh, you're faithful. Thanks for for your support and always popping in. Uh, Jiminy011, are you still suggesting people cross into Mexico and Arizona? We will be traveling from Canada soon. Jimmy, it all depends where you're going. Um, if you're going towards, um, and here's the thing about crossing in Arizona, and I need to make sure that to make this clear because somebody was uh, actually showed me an opposite route or a, an alternative route going through Arizona. And the alternative route was going through Arizona and going down the West Coast, go through Sinaloa, through Sonora. And some of that area is okay, but then I was like, no, you don't want to go through some of that area at also. So necessarily crossing in Arizona isn't going to, you got to look at your whole trip and where you're going to go. Uh, if you're going to be going towards like San Miguel de Allende, my, my, uh, my advice is always Eagle Pass instead of Laredo. Um, if things have calmed down since my last video in Eagle Pass, now there is still a lot of stuff going on in Laredo, Reynosa, all of that area. Um, so I wouldn't, Arizona, yes, if you're going to Ensenada, or you're going to, um, what's the other one, Rocky Point, um, and uh, certain areas, yes. Cross, or if you're going to come down through Arizona and cross back across towards like uh, the northern part, uh, but if you're going to go down the West Coast, maybe not so much. Uh, it just depends on your uh, where where your what what's your actual final destination, Jimmy? And maybe I might be able to give you a better insight. 
Susan Wirt, new sub here. Thank you. And you know what, Susan? Thank you for subscribing because that is what helps me. That's, you know, when I, when I say like this video and subscribe, it helps me get the word out. And just like I said in my last video, subscribing, liking, it helps me make content to help you. And that's the bottom line. Uh, it's not about money for me. It's never been about money. I don't take any kind of sponsorships, like I said. And you know what? Subscribing helps the algorithm get it out to more people. And these videos that I do about court, it's not about getting the views. It's about having a resource. Even if you need to help somebody else out, hey, I know this guy, let me share the link to this video. And you might be able to help someone else out. It's all about helping each other out. That's what it, that's, uh, what it can. That's what is very important. Okay, Heather K, Telso roams for me for the extra, with no extra fees, but I only get data limits per day. Yeah, I, that's, I guess that's what, what I was paying for at one time. I guess they do give you free roaming, but data limits per day. Um, my best adv advice is to switch to AT&T, to be honest with you, or Cricket, to be honest with you, because they're even cheaper. Uh, and they roam. I get better service here in Mexico than I do at Cricket in the United States. Can you help us understand citizenship for us to start? We don't have relatives from Mexico. Just point me in the right direction. Heather, citizenship is um, actually, there's several tracks to citizenship. Uh, of course, the obvious ones are that you were, actually, that's a good, that's a good subject for a video. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I think I might have done a live stream on this, on the different tracks to citizenship. But uh, basically, I, sh uh, I should do a video on it. And, and actually, I'm going to put that on my list and do it as soon as possible because I'm trying to get a, as many videos as I can out before I go out to San Miguel. So I'll have some content for you guys to, 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 to keep looking at. But there are several. The obvious ones are... You know, you had a grandmother, grandfather, father, mother, daughter. Those are the obvious ones to citizenship. Uh, now, there's some other paths to citizenship. If you were a permanent resident for a certain amount of time, those types of things. Uh, and then you also have to take a history and cultural exam, which is very, very, very difficult. Uh, I'm waiting two more years till I turn 60. Uh, to so I'll be exempt from that, but I'm not exempt from the Spanish speaking exam. You actually have to take a Spanish exam where you have to uh, be competent in, in Spanish. And not only do you have to take the Spanish exam, it's basically a conversation. You you speak to the uh, the the person from foreign relations, um, and then you also uh, they give you a picture and you have ten minutes, I guess it was, to write. A paragraph about what you see in the picture and they actually even look at your grammar and everything and then uh you can uh you but you don't have to take the history and culture exam but you're not exempt from the actual uh, uh language exam uh heather i'll do and to be honest with you it's um i'm not too sure so i don't want to say it but uh, there's uh, the other thing is is that you have to have been in the country for five years, but you couldn't have been out of the country for more than 180 days. I think it is. I'll have to make sure because I don't want to make any commitments here. I, I, I'll rather do it in a video. So be on the lookout for that video, and uh, I'll try to simplify it. You know, just basically, um, you know what? You got these tracks. You're, you know, you got this track. You got that track. You got that track. And this is how long you have to wait for this. This is how long you have to wait for this. This is how long you have to wait for this. And this is what's required. And uh, maybe simplify it a little bit. And I will do a video, Heather. Uh, yes, please do a video on citizenship. I will. I definitely will. I promise. And actually, um, this week we'll discuss it. My wife and I will discuss it. I'll put that on my list of videos to do this week, actually. Uh, I prioritize videos that are requested by my audience. So I do have some other ideas and we were going to do and everything else and research. But if, uh, if, uh, if you guys have an idea for a video, I prioritize that first. Actually, uh, that'll probably be one of my next videos. If not the next, 
the, the, the one after that. Susan Ward, would I be more likely to get a 10-day visa at a border crossing by land rather than in the airport? Actually, Susan, it, I don't know how it's working anymore, but when you go through a land border, when you go through the airport, when you get on the airplane, you pay this tourist fee. Actually, for residents, a lot of residents complain about it, and then they actually call them back, and they get a, they get a, they get a refund. And the residence fee, uh, you pay, not the residence fee, but the FMM fee, you're really paying for your, your extended stay. When you go to the land border, usually I think it's a 10-day, 7-day or 10-day you get for free, and then after 10 days you have to pay which is already included in your airline ticket. So I, what used to happen at the land border, because I haven't done an FMM in a long time at the land border, was they would say, do you want the free one for seven days or 10 days? Or do you want the 180 days? Or do you want six months? Or do you want three months? Because if you want more than three months, then it's 200 pesos or 500 pesos. I don't remember how much it was. So if they're still doing that, then you could probably get it at a land border. You are probably going to be more likely get a get the land borders are kind of disconnected from the airports and everything else in immigration. Um, and so uh, as far as getting 10 days, 20 days, 14 days, you're more likely to be in luck if you're going through a land border. Now, I'm almost sure uh, uh, the the land border Actually, uh, the the land border is going to be a little bit more. Uh, we'll give you the free one, or we'll give you 180 days. For that's what I would think. And Angie Hernandez, what's what's the TUA on airfare? That's exactly what I was talking about. The TUA is the tourist fee that, that you're paying for your FMM. And if you're a resident, uh, sometimes. Oh, yeah, exactly, Brett. It's not outside of Mexico for more than 180 days in the two years prior to filing. Yes, Brett, uh, that's the one of them. But then I also believe there's some time, there's some times that you have to uh, be in Mexico before you can even apply. So that's where I'm going to straighten that out and do that in a video. Adrian, video suggestion: buying a car, getting a driver's license. Yes. I'll do that. Actually, getting a driver's license is kind of a weird thing because depending on where you're at, it's a different process. But uh, buying a car, definitely. Uh, we bought a Mexican vehicle. You're probably going to need your IRC and uh, a couple of other things and your residency too. Wow. Uh, Jose Amonsi. Where I live, they no longer bag groceries. They got rid of plastic bags. Actually, in Monterrey, they don't have plastic bags either. But you have to bring your own bags, and they also sell them there. But uh, but they still have the baggers there in the grocery store. Okay, Brett. And actually, Brett, I love Brett coming on here because he knows a lot about Mexico and, and stuff like this. And he's even corrected me on a couple of things. If you're a temporary or permanent resident you aren't subject to fmm fee yes that's that's correct uh and brett was one of the ones that brought this up and uh, one of the other ones they call it a visitor fee but that's what you, that's what you're paying for your 180 days or your 60 days or whatever it might be but if you're a resident you are not you can request a refund and also, Brett, if I'm not mistaken, some people will tell them uh, up front, I'm a resident. And some airlines, uh, if you can show proof of residency, won't even, uh, they'll, they'll, won't charge you the fee, actually, believe it or not. That's what I've seen people say. But most people say that you have to go through the refund process. I've never had to, I've never flown out like that. So... Uh, actually, we fly. If we even go to the United States, we fly into Monterrey. We we used to do that from Querétaro into Monterrey, spend time with family, and then cross over. So I haven't had that tourist fee slapped onto my plane ticket, but you do have a right to get it back. Danielle Devineo, does my wife had to get a tip to drive? 
and will she need to cross as a tourist to Mexico? Danielle, it depends. Here's the thing. The tip is if you want to bring a foreign-plated vehicle, I, I like I had said before, uh, I did the video on that. I gave all the requirements. Now, let's say you get the tip. Your wife can drive the vehicle because it's a wife, it's a spouse, mother, father, son, or daughter can drive your vehicle, okay? Even if they're Mexican citizens, all right? Uh, it's immediate family. Now, here's the thing. It's kind of a weird thing in the Mexican law because a Mexican law says a Mexican citizen cannot drive a foreign-plated vehicle, okay? That's the actual or permanent resident cannot drive a foreign plate of view. That's what it says in the Mexican law. But then there's this exemption from customs that says your mother, your father, your daughter, your son, or your spouse can drive your car. So you, it's a customs regulation, not an actual law. And then there's another customs regulation that says, if you're a temporary resident in the United States and you need to come back to Mexico, but you're a Mexican citizen, you can get a tip for 180 days. But wait, the law says that a Mexican citizen can't drive a foreign-plated vehicle. So these are exceptions through customs regulations that allow that to happen. Now, what I do tell people is if your wife or husband or whoever it is or who's going to drive the car, that's your immediate relative, that you actually, I think Sonia Diaz actually has a, if you go to her website, she has the actual customs regulation where you can actually download it. I actually say, put a copy in your glove compartment box and of those tip regulations. And that way, if a local cop stops you and says, hey, you're a Mexican citizen, I don't care if you're married to this person that has a tip, uh, then uh, you can pull out that, here's this customs regulation and this is the exception, right? Um, so, that's the other thing. And the other exception is if it's not an immediate family member, like your mechanic, your, your cousin, uh, or somebody else that's not a U.S. citizen, needs to drive your car, the tip holder has to be in the vehicle. Uh, and also what I would also do is if your wife needs to drive the car and you get the tip, then basically... Uh, you have some, she has some type of proof that she's related to you if she needs to drive the vehicle by herself and you're not in the car with her. Uh, the opposite is also the truth, uh, is also the same. If she gets the tip, you can drive the vehicle if you're a Mexican. I don't know what your situation is. Uh, and, uh, and Brett, yeah, I, I thought five years and, uh, and I think it's five years, except for I think if you have relatives that were born in Spain or something like that, it was it's two years. Uh, but I understand it's five years. Yes, Heather, I, I understand it's five years. That's off the top of my head. But like I said, I don't like to make, uh, yeah, this is the way it is. And then, uh, by the way, uh, I made a mistake. And, and I, I don't have a problem in making a mistake, but I don't like to commit to. And actually, believe it or not, Heather, uh, I think it's best that I do a video because this is something that might uh, might benefit everybody else and is a great idea for a video. Let me see. And, uh, and actually, Cross as a tourist, I don't know if you're saying that your wife's a dual citizen. I had this question asked on the tip video. Uh, what about dual citizens? And I have made a video that um, it, I did make a video about dual citizens, what they do. They come in on their U.S. passport as a tourist, but technically you're not supposed to do that, but people still do. Uh, but it is against the law. Technically, when you enter Mexico as a dual citizen, you have to enter as a Mexican citizen. Any official legal process that you do in Mexico. If you're a dual citizen, you have to do it as a Mexican citizen. You can't do it as an American citizen. That's why when we talk about, and you can lose, if you're a naturalized Mexican citizen, you can actually lose your citizenship. Uh, if you're not an, if you're a citizen by birth, they can't take away your citizenship, but they can actually fine you large amounts of money. Now, does this happen? Well, I don't know. People continue to do that, uh, where they get a tip and they come in on their American passport all the time but I haven't heard of any instances where they've gotten fined, but it's technically against the law.
Is my home still for sale? Yes, it's still for sale. Actually, my last video, uh, believe it or not, my last video, I somebody inquired about my house and I put the link to the Imuebles listing on my home. Uh, yeah, D Daniel, okay, she's a Mexican national. Okay, that's what I thought by the tone of your question. And you're a permanent resident. Okay, here's the thing, Daniel. Um, I don't know if you're, okay, she's a Mexican national. Now, if she's got U.S. citizenship, she can technically come in on her U.S. passport, but that's technically illegal. But that's what, I lived on the border for most of my life, and I worked on the border for a good portion of my career. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I even know family members that I probably, I didn't even know it was against the law. It's a very common practice for dual citizens to come in on their U.S. passport as a tourist, get 180 days, and then get the tip. I mean, uh, I see it all the time uh, until someone brought it to my attention that it's illegal. And then I actually looked it up, and it is. Uh, so <laughs> uh, it, that's up to you to do. Now, here's the thing. That's one of the things I always say is how are they going to know your wife's a Mexican citizen? I don't know. Uh, that's probably why nobody ever gets caught because there's no system that is connected right now that I know of that now maybe a naturalized citizen, maybe you might be in the immigration databases and then they might say, hey, wait a second, time out. You are one time a permanent resident or what are you now? You know, something might happen when you go in that may raise a red flag. But as a citizen by birth or a Mexican national, how they're going to know whether you're really a Mexican or are you a... Now, here's the thing that I will warn you. Number one is uh, now you can drive the... If you do get a tip, technically you can drive the vehicle because you're the spouse. But I would have some proof that you're, you're married. Second, like I said, it is illegal to do that. Uh, and I... I've always said, I'm not the one to make the decision on what to do. I'm only here to give you the information on what. And the penalty is a very large fine uh, if you get caught. And you can get probably more than likely your car confiscated because technically if they catch you and she's a Mexican citizen and she got the tip as a U.S. citizen and they catch you and then they say, well, you need to pay this fine and we're going to take your car because technically... You shouldn't have got the tip in the first place. So more than likely, it's confiscation of your vehicle. I haven't heard of it happening, but that's the ultimate what can happen. And thank you, Ernie. Always great to support, have support from you. Yep, and I'm and I appreciate the support from my from my fans. And actually, I'm going over my hour, but we're having some good questions here. Ramon Garcia, but which passport to use when entering Mexico? Is there an impact on the ability to get a tip? Yes. Well, depending if you're a dual national, technically you have to enter with your Mexican citizenship. I mean, even if you don't have a, if you have an INE or an INE card or whatever, here's the thing with Mexico. It, well, I cross at the land borders, okay? And actually, this is a, a good question, Ramon, because somebody is having an issue. Uh, there's a dual citizen, actually. Uh, this was brought to my attention. And they're going to be flying in from Europe, but they're going to be flying in from Europe to like Monterrey. And then, but they're dual citizens, and then they're going to be going to the US. So the airlines are expecting you to be coming into Monterrey as a US citizen because you flew out to the UK or to Europe as a US citizen. So the travel agency is telling them, no, you need to come in and you need to check into the Mexico as a US citizen. But yet that's technically not right because when you enter Mexico, you have to enter Mexico as a Mexican citizen. And I don't know if uh, you've seen some of my videos where I say that you lose consulate protection and Mexico sees you as a Mexican citizen first. That's the reason, because Mexico up until, re I think it's 1997, didn't even, if you got naturalized, they didn't even recognize, you lost your citizenship. 
if you held a citizenship from another country, you lost your citizenship back in the old days. And the after 1997, they passed a law that said, no, 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 no. If you were born or you have a right to citizenship, you're a citizen. And I know some people, we even have a friend that had to go back to the Mexican, anybody that got naturalized before 97 and lost their citizenship, they go back to the Mexican consulate, have to go through a process and they get their Mexican citizenship back. And so that's the, the question of what passport do you use? You're technically supposed to use your Mexican passport or your INE. And actually, I'll, believe, I'll tell you a story that happened to us, and, and we didn't even know this, but my wife, we were traveling in from Cancun, and they decided to do an immigration check, for some reason or another, an immigration check in Monterrey. We, we got off the plane in Monterrey, and we're like, what the heck is immigration doing here? And my wife, because she worked for the, for the federal government, she renounced her technically renounced her citizenship, which you really can't renounce your citizenship technically. While you're working, you, you're not supposed to be a citizen of another country. So she was using her U.S. passport as directed. And um, she gives the FMM to the immigration officer, and they asked, they looked at her, and they's like, you're Mexican. And she says, yes. And they were looking at her kind of weird, like, you don't want to claim your Mexican citizenship? And she's like, no, can't, because that I, I can't, because I work for the U.S. government, and I have a clearance, and I can't. And I technically renounced it, so I can't. And they were, like, looking at her with the biggest puzzle on their face. Now, they didn't do anything or charge her with anything for using her U.S. documents, but I'm almost sure that's why they were looking at her kind of weird, because you're supposed to be using your Mexican documents, uh, but, and, uh, that's what you're supposed to do. And, uh, I asked in a very recent video whether as a dual citizen living abroad in the U.S., I can get a tip. I think you were the one, if I'm not, I think I answered, uh, with a kind of weird answer. I'm, I think you were the one that answered, asked that question on my video. And I did answer that that it's kind of technically illegal, but it's always done exactly what I just said right now. Everybody comes in on the US passport and they do this. That's one of those things. I don't know, technology might catch up and you might get caught eventually. But I mean, I even know people that do it all the time, uh, but technically you're supposed to do, and entering into Mexico is a legal process. When you enter into Mexico, if you're entering into Mexico, you're asking for a tip. It's an actual legal procedure. And you have to do any legal procedure as a Mexican citizen here in Mexico. You technically cannot do anything as... And that's why when you get arrested and you say, I want to call the U.S. consulate, the Mexican government's going to say, you're not a U.S. citizen, you're a Mexican citizen. Uh, yes, we recognize that you can hold two citizenships. We recognize that the other country allows it but we don't recognize you as a U.S. citizen. We only recognize you as a Mexican citizen. And that's the kind of the, 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 the dilemma that dual citizens have. Um, and like I said, do dual citizens come in on their U.S. passport, get, an, a, get a tourist FMM, and get a tip? Every day, I can tell you right now, every single day they do it. Um, have I ever heard of anybody ever getting in trouble getting their vehicle confiscated? No. But is it legal to do? No, at the same time. So I hope that answers your question. It's kind of a weird answer. It's one of those rules that it's not enforced, but if it gets enforced, it, the, the, the actual, and yes, you're living abroad, but the only exception that's given for the tip is a permanent resident. You have to be a Mexican national living legally abroad in another, a Mexican national national, not a dual citizen, a Mexican national. In other words, you are, for example, a Mexican national that went to the United States, got your permanent residency, you're living in the United States as a permanent resident, and you got to remember in the United States, if you leave the United States for more than 180 days, you lose your permanent residency, so you're permanently living there. They, rec they allow you to get a tip to bring your vehicle in. That's the only exception. And you have to use your permanent residency card 
as proof that you're a permanent resident. That's the only way you can get uh, the tip. Daniel, but I'm a permanent resident, so I can't drive the car. Yes, you can. First of all, you can drive the car. There's two things. You can drive the car because your wife got the tip. And second thing is you're a permanent, no, you're a permanent resident in Mexico or a permanent resident in the United States? Okay, no, you're a permanent resident in Mexico. Yes, that's the exception because your wife has the tip. So you are an immediate family member of that person. So, and actually, uh, like I said, I would print out the tip regulations. And uh, the other thing that I would do is if you're going to be driving the vehicle, your wife got the tip, you're pretty much going to be together. And a Mexican citizen or permanent resident can drive the vehicle if the tip holder is in the vehicle with you. So if you're driving and you get stopped and you're with your wife and she got the tip, then you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, where you might have a problem, especially with local cops or going through small towns, they're not going to understand the federal law sometimes. They're going to say, no, 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 I don't care. You're a Mexican citizen or you're a permanent resident and you... You can't drive. That's why I always advise to go ahead and print out that tip regulation. And that way you can say, well, this is a Mexican customs regulation that allows me to do that. Daniel Devena, has anyone got in trouble for not having an RFE? I think you're talking about RFC. Uh, nobody's gotten in trouble, Daniel. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, I think in certain immigration offices, they're already even starting to issue they're at, they were asking people do you want one and uh in certain inm offices are already starting to issue it's probably going to be part of the residency process eventually nobody's gotten in trouble believe it or not even mexican citizens haven't gotten in trouble uh because of the problem they haven't been able to enforce it because sat is really way behind and trying to get everybody their their rfc what's going to happen more than getting in trouble is you're going to have a hard time doing anything. As a matter of fact, even CFE, the electric company, is going to start requiring. I'm mean, actually, they have even reached out to a lot of people saying, you need to send your RFC and your Constancia. They call it Constancia. What's your situation, physical situation? Um, and you're going to be, your physical situation as a person living here is going to be uh, no financial responsibilities or tax tax liabilities. Uh, and there's an actual RFC that you print out and you send them your constancia. And uh, even so even hooking up utilities is going to be uh, uh, a really bear to do. Uh, getting a Mexican bank account eventually is going to be impossible without an RFC. So the way of enforcing it is not necessarily telling you, oh, we're going to put you in jail or, oh, we're going to fine you because you don't have one. It's just going to be like, oh, you want a bank account? You can't get one because you don't have an RC. Uh, do you want you want to buy a car? Can't buy one. Don't care if you're a permanent resident. You don't have an RC. Want to buy a piece of property? Can't do it. Don't have an RC. That's the way. Uh, and even transferring money to somebody you might even, they might even say, hey, you need an RFC in order to transfer this amount to somebody's bank account, even from the United States, from WISE or whatever, eventually. I'm just saying eventually. This, these are things that could happen. And they might say, well, we need your RFC, even though, uh, uh, but I don't have one. Okay, then you, they, we won't be allowed, allowed to do the transfer. Um, so that's where the RFC is going to come into effect. But it hasn't been... It hasn't been proven yet or, uh, well, not proven, but uh, totally implemented yet. That's a better word for it. And I don't know what to, uh, how are you going to know facial recognition is getting more advanced? So it's not far-fetched that it is a place they can roll it out whenever they get motivated. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about the RSC or the CURP. Um, but they're rolling out the RFC. It's just a matter of trying. The problem, like, for example, Monterrey, it, the virtual line was like, I mean, I'm not kidding you. It was like, it took me, I got it through a facilitator, and then I had to go and get my e-firma, and it took us about a month before we got a, 
And that was because this is a big office and they process real quick. Some people have been waiting two, three months for their, for their appointment. And uh, Kai, thank you. Well, thank you, Kai, for, for, for supporting. That was January 2008. You became a naturalized citizen before the law changed. Yeah, I think not 2008. It was 1997 that the law changed. And if you was before, I, maybe I did I say 2008? If you, if you were naturalized before 1990, not 1998, it's 1997 is when the law changed. Is uh, but you are actually um, you if the law uh, if it was prior to 1997 if I'm not mistaken uh, you lost your citizenship and then you have to go back to do a whole process and they give you your passport back and everything. Susan, if I cross at Laredo, I get a. 10-day visa, will the tip still be? No. The tip is tied to the, uh, the tip is tied. Here's the thing. If you noticed in my video on the tip, the tip is tied. You have to be legally in the country for the tip to be valid. So even if they were to issue it to you for 180 days, okay, the tip is only good for the 10 days you have the FMM. So if they ever catch you and you're out of status, and you're in your vehicle, then you're going to have issues because they can confiscate your vehicle because the tip is no longer good. The tip is only good with a valid FMM. And actually, in most cases, if, for example, you get 10 days, they'll issue the tip to expire in 10 days. Most of the time on the land border, what they will do is they will base. As a matter of fact, the way the process works is you go, you take the documents to the SAT, section where they give the Van Hersito section, but it's sat also. You give them the paperwork and then they say, go get your FMM on the other side and then come back with your FMM. And then you go and you get your FMM and then you come back with your FMM and then they issue you the tip based on your FMM. That's the way it works in, in McAllen, Texas and, and most places. So it's kind of going back and forth. Daniel Domino, why can't my wife, as a natural-born Mexican, drive in here U.S.-plated vehicle without a tip? She has U.S. Daniel, that's what I'm trying to explain, is that your wife, when she enters Mexico, the minute she comes into Mexico, she is considered a Mexican citizen. Mexico doesn't recognize your U.S. citizenship. The tip, and the law says a Mexican citizen cannot drive a U.S.-plated vehicle. Now, if your wife comes in as an American citizen, which is also technically illegal, like I said, but everybody does it, gets a 180-day FMM and comes in as a U.S. citizen, then she can get her tip. Then she can drive the car if she has her tip. Unless someone says, hey, wait, you violated the law because you're a Mexican citizen, too. That is what, that's what everybody needs to understand about the tip. Being a U.S. citizen is not what gives you the right to, to, to have a tip. Actually, permanent residents can't drive. Permanent residents that are U.S. citizens cannot drive a U.S.-plated vehicle or a foreign-plated vehicle unless you're in the free zone. Now, I need to remember, I forget to tell everybody this, the free zone, which is 20-something miles within, and it's also Baja, California. If you're going to stay in Baja, California, or you're going to stay in Cancun, but you still need a tip to get to Cancun, or you need to ship your car to Cancun, uh, you don't need a tip. But other than the free zones, you need a tip. So the, uh, technically, in your situation, the only way that you'll be able to do this is her enter as a U.S. citizen. But like I said, technically, it's illegal. Does anybody get caught doing this? Not that I know of. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I, I can tell you right now, I even have family members that do it or have done it. Um, so, and as a matter of fact, I don't even need, I don't even know, I don't even think half the Mexicans that do it or dual nationals that do it even know it's illegal, to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't know it. And that was just common practice for me. I just thought that was okay. I didn't know it until someone let me know. So that's basically, so. Daniel, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, go for it. And uh, gra actually, Sonia Diaz uh, has a, a look up Sonia Diaz Mexico. Uh, she's got the tip regulations really nicely laid out, and uh, it'll tell you uh, what you got to do. But like I said, and actually, I brought this up on a live stream that, hey, you know what? If you're a Mex if you're a dual national, just come in on your U.S. passport, and that's when I was corrected. That's when we looked up the law. We actually looked it up. That's when I went and I actually went with uh, several attorneys to see if that is actually true. They looked it up too, and that's the way the law is written, and that's the way it works. You technically, when you're a Mexican, a dual, that's the problem with dual nationality. And that's when I tell everybody, what's the, when someone says, what's the drawback of being a dual national? What's the drawback of having U.S. citizenship and Mexican citizenship? The drawback is, is that one, the minute you enter Mexico, yes, Mexico recognizes dual citizenship. Before Mexico said, you can only have one citizenship. And if you don't, if you have another one, you lose your Mexican citizenship. Now Mexico, after 1997, says, you know what? You're allowed to have as many citizenships as you want, but the minute you enter Mexico, you're a Mexican. You're not a U.S. citizen. You're not, in other words, you get arrested, you don't have consulate protection You, as a U.S. citizen. You cannot say, I'm a U.S. citizen. I, wanna, I want the consulate. The Mexican government is going to tell you that you are a Mexican citizen first. Your U.S. citizenship now, and, and the U.S. consulate also has, a, and also if the U.S. consulate tries to intercede on your behalf, unless it's a high profile, sometimes a high profile, uh, the U.S. embassy gets involved, yes. But the U.S. consulate is going to tell you, uh, the U.S. consulate is going to say, well, you know what, we can help you, we can't. Uh, and the argument the Mexican government is going to have to the U.S. consulate is that this person is a Mexican citizen. So that's one of the things, even naturalizing. I'm going to naturalize in two years. That's one, and I, and I want to just because of my pride of living here in Mexico. But those are the things that I'm like, you know what? That will, I know what I'm giving up. And I know that the minute that I become a Mexican citizen my U.S. citizenship protections go away. That's the bottom line. Um, I, can't, I can't pull the U.S. card. I can't pull out my passport and say, I'm U.S., I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen. If I have dual nationality, uh, and, but here's the thing, there's a lot of advantages to being a Mexican citizen, okay? Um, there is a lot of advantages to being a Mexican citizen, okay? Um, that's why after, you know, uh, we left the government, my wife was able to get her citizenship back, but there's a lot of, 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 of benefits to it. But at the same time, that's the thing you, you can't pull the U S citizen card. The minute you're a Mexican citizen, you can't, as a matter of fact, believe it or not, if you become a naturalized citizen, and you do any official process as an American citizen in the country of Mexico, including entering into the country of Mexico on this tip thing, you lose your citizenship automatically. That's the bottom line. Uh, that's the way it works here in Mexico. And that's one of the things that I brought up and I've brought up in videos. And I know that a lot of people argue that, you know, but there's there there's is advantages. It's not only disadvantages, but there are advantages. So, uh, you know, that's the, that, that's the bottom line, Daniel. I'm not trying to rain on your parade. I'm just telling you the rules. Um, 
you can look up. You should be able to drive if your if your wife comes in as a U.S. citizen gets a, gets a 180 day tip and gets an FMM for 180 days. You can drive the vehicle because number one, if she's in the vehicle with you, that's allowed. And number two, if for whatever reason, um, if for whatever reason uh, you need to drive the vehicle, you're a uh, what do you call it? Uh, immediate relative. That's the tip exception. Now, the only thing that you'll have an issue with is if you're willing to risk the fact that uh, if you get caught doing that, that's there's a there's a well, your wife's a Mexican national by birth, so she's not going to lose her citizenship. But you risk a large fine and having your vehicle confiscated. That's that. That's how it works. Uh, if you can come up with something different or argue something different with some good evidence, uh, I'm, I'm more than well, welcome to share it with the community because one of the things I tell everybody is I don't know everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, even this tip thing that I'm even giving you, the uh, I hate to sound like I'm giving you a lecture. I'm trying not to give you a lecture. But even this tip thing, I didn't even know about it until someone brought it to my attention and I actually had to look it up. <laughs> so, uh, or coming in as a U.S. citizen, we, neither my wife nor I, my wife's a Mexican citizen by birth. And I didn't even know. And she didn't even know. We both were surprised. Actually, uh, at one point in time, I will tell you right now, I even thought, hey, I'm going to get my Mexican citizenship and then we'll go get a U.S. plated vehicle and then you get six months and I'll get six months. We'll come in on our U.S. passport because you can only get it for 180 days and then we'll be good and we can buy a vehicle for cheaper. And then uh, literally I found this out later on and I'm like, well, shoot, now both of, both of us are going to be Mexican citizens and we can't do that. Uh, and that was a that was a wake up call for me. Daniel, I, I actually was a wake-up call for me, too. I didn't understand because my whole life, living on the border, growing up on the border, going, traveling with people in their vehicles, Mexican citizens, dual citizens, uh, dual citizens, actually dual citizens, checking in with their American passport, um, been with them when they get their actual tip, and let's go. And when they're 180 day FMM, I've actually been in the vehicle with them when they do it. So is it possible? Yes. Is it legal? No. And did I know that it wasn't illegal? No, not until recently. <laughs> Brett, this is why I don't drive in Mexico, LOL. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we, we, we went two, yeah, two hours of stream. I like to keep it to an hour. Uh, I'm going to cut out uh, the first five minutes as soon as this video processes. Um, and hopefully I'll get my intro back. Uh, we'll see you next live stream. And uh, like I said, I'll do a, a video on uh, the citizenship for sure. And uh, I also working on finishing up the RFC. And thank you very much for your help. And uh, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. And like I said, it helps me make content to help you. And uh, you guys have a good night. And we'll talk to you soon. And as I always say, stay informed, stay safe, and stay informed.